Hello, and welcome to Boise State in the Community. I'm your host, Olivia Smock, and with us tonight is Dr. Rishmi Mukherjee. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, to get started off, uh, you're a professor of literature here, and you recently taught a class called Other Voices, Alternative Imaginations. Can you elaborate a little more on what the class consists of? Um, this class is mainly about uh, productive communication between the refugee and non-refugee communication, meaning how do we interact between these two communities. So uh, what we do in this class is um, we talk about the, what is a refugee, you know, who becomes a refugee, um, the politics behind the word refugee, um, and also when a refugee moves to another country, the host country, what kind of relationship it builds with the non-refugee community and and what is the responsibility that the non-refugee community has in terms of um, understanding the refugee community. So it's, it's mainly about that. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I chose to offer this course, because as you said, I'm a professor of literature, but this is Many people think a course on communication, which is right. It is a course on communication. Um, I just use different ways of communication, literature being one of them. Um, the need arose from a concern, um, and this is something that I was observing um, in the community itself, how refugee and non-refugee people communicate between each other. And there was a huge patronizing attitude from the non-refugee community. Whenever I was talking to anybody, about um, issues pertaining to the refugee uh, um, crisis per se, um, all I heard was people wanting to help. There was a huge savior complex, right? What can I do? It's almost like the refugee is a victim in need of saving and needs to be saved. And I was hugely um, discomforted by that. Um, so um, being in Boise, when I moved to Boise, one of the things that got me excited was the multicultural composition of the city. Um, so. I, I just thought that, you know, what a great way to start this conversation. And I'm in the academic field, so why not BSU be one of that? That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, what do you think students take away from the class? Um, so I have to tell you what students come in this class expecting first to tell you what they take away from this class. So what happens is uh, usually, uh, I have taught this class twice, so my experience is limited that way. When they first come to take this class, they usually think that this class is about, it's, it's very charitable in nature, you know? In, the, in this class, we're gonna talk a lot about how can we save the refugee. It's again, it back to square one, but very early on, second or third day, they realize, oh no, it's about what am I, I not doing. So it's more about the non-refugee than the refugee uh, community and how we are not doing enough or we are somehow unconsciously doing something to not make that communication possible. So the first week it's disappointment, anxiety, anger even I will say, right? Um, and then once things get stabilized and, they tr and we start talking about issues, um, I think, I mean, the evaluations are great if that's any marker of how this course is. Um, and I have to say, I have not had even one student drop out after the first class. Wow. They stick around, maybe they're angry, uh, you know, they want to figure it out. And when they go out, I think they're pretty um, satisfied, but also a little depressed, <laughs> you know. Uh, more conscious, I would say. More conscious? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds like a really great perspective to come from with that. Uh, to give us a better understanding, what would you define as a refugee? You know, the term refugee already is so loaded and unfortunately uh, with negative stereotype. And I say that because refugee today has become, the word itself has become an object, a commodity in the market, right? We do not... Uh, think of a refugee as a human. So, uh, or we don't tend to think that the refugee has a voice, it has an agency or a consciousness, right? We all, the only thing that comes to our mind is a refugee is a hapless uh, victim. We don't think that a refugee is a victim of a political crisis that any one of us can face any day, right? And I can give you an example um, why I don't want to define a refugee 
I mean, I, I don't have to, it's already yeah. defined. What I do in my class is deconstruct it, break that. Uh -huh. um, you know, like um, I once met somebody who was a professor of anthropology in Baghdad University, and he's a dishwasher here, right? Oh, wow. And people don't think of that. And one of the thing of the constructs of a refugee very quickly, um, you know, and I don't want to simplify this, but I'll still go ahead and say that in our society here, we tend to think of a refugee in the same way that we think of a homeless person, right? Um, like a homelandless person. Um, although we know today, and we should be aware that even a homeless person, I mean, it's a very common rhetoric that you're homeless because of bad choices that you made in life. It's really not that, especially after the economic depression that we've been through. Um, so somehow, again, unconsciously, we start making that illusion, right? You're a refugee. Somehow you are culpable in the situation that you are in. So when you are given refuge in another country, yes, it's a very good thing, you know, mm -hmm. but also you have to somehow be very um, subjugated, very submissive and, you know, so you have to fit into that image of the refugee as a victim. The moment you start speaking, you become a threat. And uh, what I mean is in today's world, you see, right, refugee and terrorism. Mm -hmm. Very so either you're a victim or you're a threat. So in my class what we do is try to stop doing those broad assumptions Victim and terrorist. Where do we come a middle path? So to say mm -hmm. So that thank you so much for giving us that insight into that That's a really some great points to think about um, a common question people have when it comes to refugees is the expense and Do they actually cost us money as taxpayers? No, not at all, they don't. And I can give you a few examples here. So the first thing, right, when they come in, it's true they don't have a lot of money, they don't bring money, um, they cannot bring money. Uh, so what happens is, you know, whichever agency is directing them or they come through, they are given three months worth of money to sustain themselves. Now what those, that money is, it's actually a credit that is given to you because we live in a credit society right so you need to have a credit card so if you're in this country and I came to this country 12 years ago as a graduate student and I very quickly learned that if you don't have a credit card you're really I mean you're nothing right it's like identity less so you're craving for that credit card so you can imagine for a refugee that becomes a huge uh, you know thing to achieve but what that three months of money is is actually the credit and you have to pay it back you know, you are paying it back and the refugees, they do pay it back with interest. It's, it's not that. The second thing is, as I said, a professor of anthropology in Baghdad is a dishwasher here in one restaurant. Can you imagine the skilled labor that you're getting, right? Mm -hmm. Education, we, what we get, many of the refugees come from countries where education is not as expensive. You know, socialist countries. I mean, uh, so they are most often than not they have graduate degree, postgraduate degree. So what you're getting also is highly qualified people to work. You're getting skilled laborers as well. Um, and for countries, you know, in Europe especially, like Germany, they actually need people to come because their workforce, right, 25 to 45, in a span of 10 years, they won't have that. They're losing their population. So they actually welcome refugees because they need that. So they're adding to the labor force. And it happens everywhere. The other thing is they're also cheap labor in this country too because you don't validate the degree that they have, right? They're engineers, doctors, teachers, uh, but the United States does not recognize that. Mm -hmm. So um, you like it or not, yes, uh, many of them work with very low wages here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody with double masters from Nepal is a janitor in a strip mall here, and I know him, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, you kind of went into some of the ways that uh, refugees benefit our country. Can you go into some of the other ways that they uh, Th that they benefit us? I mean, the other great thing is the multiculturalism that they bring in, right? Language, food, culture. This is what makes a nation great, right? I mean, in today's world of globalization, we are trying to break boundaries all the time, at least mm -hmm. theoretically, that's what we are saying. And it's a good thing to have that kind of exposure. Any country who's had that has had a very bright future. I think for the generation now, it's extremely important for us too. You know, it's very, very important. We see that. It gives you that global perspective. It opens up. So uh, you don't have to necessarily, I mean, 
going abroad, study abroad is fantastic. I'm not saying you don't, but you know, you don't have to actually go somewhere to seek it out. It's there, it's here, right? Mm -hmm. So I think from a, from, a, from a social point of view, from a cultural point of view, it's fantastic mm -hmm. uh, having people from all over. So the cultural point has to be taken into, and it's not a small point, it's not a small issue, it's a big one. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, since you teach so much about refugees, what previous experience or knowledge do you have that helped you uh, start helping the refu refugee community in this way? Um, so when I was doing my MPhil in Women's Studies in India, um, I got this job with a UNIFEM. Um, and I also got involved in a project with UNICEF on the issue of anti-human trafficking for prostitution. So I was traveling a lot for that, um, Bangladesh, Nepal, um, Thailand. And when I was in Nepal, so this issue is, you know, human trafficking and you know so who are the girls young girls who are being trafficked um, and I went to Nepal and I was in a refugee camp and I learned many girls in the refugee camp are also easy target you know they're vulnerable to this kind of trafficking um, and one thing led to the other and I spoke I, I speak Nepali because um, my father's hometown is um, f um, you know, foothills of Himalaya. So I just speak Nepali, I just picked it up. So, you know, that helped in conversation. And I learned so much and that was really my first time. So I was actually meeting the Bhutanese refugees in Nepal. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my entry into it. Um, very brief, I worked on the issue of anti-human trafficking for a long, for two years. And then I came to do grad studies here. Obviously, you know, I always wanted to get back to you know, these issues I wanted to, but I was pursuing my academics, job, everything. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Boise, I saw the opportunity, I jumped at it. Um, mm -hmm. And also I have to say, I didn't really do it consciously, like I was not looking to do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I bumped into people and they said, okay, this and that. And as I said, you know, fall of 2014, I was sensing this need to have a conversation. I teach courses like uh, gender biopower and biopolitics, right? on war, uh, post-colonial literature. These are issues that come all the time. So it's not a first time I'm having a conversation. My students actually in these classes, I've got the sense, right? I do global literature. I got the sense that they needed, they wanted it. And then I thought, why not write a proposal? So this was offered through ISLE, the Intensive Semester Learning Experience a course, okay. um, because there was a big budget involved in it. We also had a fun social experiment in the form of a workshop, quilting workshop. Yes. So, you know, as I said, this was about communication or the lack of it between mm -hmm. the two communities. And um, as part of the ISLE course, we had to show different teaching methodology, right? How are you teaching one issue from different perspective? So one was definitely the in-class teaching, discussion, learning, whatnot. And the other was I organized this um, workshop with children, quilting workshop. Um, and that was more to see, I say fun social experiment because it was very idealistic, very romantic, but it was fun. So we thought, all right, language has its hierarchy, right? And especially refugees, wherever they go, and we are talking in context of this country, they may or may not speak English. So sometimes they get, most often than not actually, they get challenged by not knowing the lang language. So, and you know, again, I come back to this professor of anthropology. He didn't know English very well. So his response to anything was yes and no. But the person talking to him thought he was restricted, you know, he was agency less. That's not the case. So we were saying, why not? see if we use a non-verbal means of communication between two groups to see how that hierarchy can be mitigated. We chose children 11 to 14, you know, between ages of 11 and 14, because my understanding was, you know, these people don't vote yet, so they're not political subjects, right? Not enmeshed in the sense, not messed up the way we are in terms of our, you know, with words and refugee, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I got kids from, so one was from um, a school, downtown, you know, very, you know, so, so-called upper class, um, non-refugee school. And the other one was school kids from refugee, you know, where, so I got these two kids together uh, to see how they converse via quilting. And it was not really one was asking each other a question. So they had individual quilt in the beginning, small quilts, where they, uh, uh, you know, they stitched what their life aspiration was. And then there was another quilt, same size, where both of them had to make space for each other to do the same. Oh. 
Um, it was a five day long workshop. The first two days we were like, no one was talking to each other. So we could see the kids very, very sitting. And so, you know, this, um, you know, non-refugee kids in one corner, refugee in the other, but third, day onwards and it became, a, it, it was really fun. I um, mean, I jokingly call it one big fat Indian wedding, but it really was fun. That's so great to hear. Yeah. Um, how exactly does your work and um, the class that you're teaching uh, help students help the community when they're done with the class? I don't know. I mean, I, I know a lot of people know about this course. I don't know how far reach this is. I do want to keep teaching this course, but um, you know, from my part, I try to make an effort and from my students also do the same. My, my motto is, you know, um, I'm a teacher. What I can do is I can teach 20 kids with the hope that 20 of them will talk to one person that will become 40 and 40 will become 80, right? This is my activism. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I can change 20 minds, that's fantastic for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's all I can do. I'm limited in that. Uh, from the community, we worked with Artisans for Hope, one of the organizations um, who helped us with quilting and oh, everything. Okay. They work with refugee women who have come up to me to say, you know, it's great that you're doing this because mm -hmm. no one talks about communication. Everybody comes and talks to us about, oh, we're so sorry. How can we help? It's always that patronizing oh. attitude. So. Um, I've been told by agencies um, who work with refugees that they would like more of these courses to be taught and if I could come and talk. I've spoken on different occasions. Mm -hmm. But as I said, you know, I, I, my focus is my classroom. Uh, I mean, I don't want to become, again, otherwise I'll become the savior, right? I'll also grow the savior complex. I really don't want to, I, mm -hmm. I yeah. So, but um, I hope it'll make some impact, some difference in thinking, if nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that ripple effect of, right, you know, right. how, how what you do, yeah, you know, helps yeah. affect the whole community. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I can give you a simple example here and um, no offense. Many of you may have known about this, but um, last summer, beginning of summer, there was a Facebook campaign by a Boise State student. Give me all your toothpaste. This was on Facebook. So the the person who was doing this um, toothpaste raising, like fundraising, he wrote on that particular post that I'm a gun-totting Republican. I totally believe that Syrian refugees should not come in. There is a good possibility they'll become terrorists. So they had all those jingoism, xenophobia, right? But then he also wrote, I'm collecting toothpaste because I want to help them out. Now. And I, again, I say, you know, many people, many, many people supported him, including people I know, maybe, right? This is Boise State, this is an academic. And I, I saw some of the names over there who are like cheering for this. And then I thought, this is a very naive way of supporting something that they don't even realize how innately racist this whole situation is, right? I'm a post-colonialist, I do theory, I get it very easily. I'm like, all right, so what do you think? Really toothpaste is the one thing that they need, so it's a cleaning mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. We'll clean them. It's, it's very symbolic and, and it's very, very offensive. Yeah. Many people joined that, um, I don't know what came of it, but I know there was they did it. But when I spoke to the community, you know, some of the refugees, and I have students in my class, they were just like pissed off, right? Yeah. How are we doing this? How is this being supported? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know? and, and so what I want for the community or for my students to do is, you know, I understand there are so many things that's going on around us. So many people are saying so many things that are offensive. You cannot stop everyone to say, hey, why did you say that? This is not right. But I have a role to play here, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not naively like, all right, if somebody's saying all I'm concerned about is this charitable disposition, right? Celebrity humanism, sort of, mm -hmm. uh, right? Let's think about it. Mm -hmm. Let's think a little bit, you know, what does this word mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what we are here for, right? I'm in the business of making students think, making them critical thinkers. Um, so that's another thing I definitely would like my students to. That's a really great point to be a little more, more mindful of yeah, yeah. your words. Yeah. Um, just as a final question, for those who are not able to take your class, what would be some advice on them to help to raise awareness and get correct information on the refugee community? Um, I would say, you know, don't just, you know, we are consumers in this world of globalization. There's nothing else we can do. We consume everything more than we can. Mm -hmm. I would say if possible, 
filter it, right? And in consumption of news, consumption. So, you know, uh, don't just look at one thing from one perspective, right? There are many ways of looking at it. The way you see me, I am to your left, but the way I see you, you are to my right, right? The way I see them, the way they see me. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's different. And yeah. um, so I think if you think a little bit about perspective, that helps a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. What is reality? Um, is it an optical illusion, right? Do, are we only thinking of reality the way we want to think of reality? What is real, right? These small, small questions, I think, will help a long way. You don't have to come to my class, really, to do it. What I do is I just, you know, it's like sharpening the knife. You can do it. I just help you mm -hmm. sharpen it. Um, I, I, I mean, Boise State students are very smart I and mean, very intelligent and honestly this class the materials that we read it's very difficult but they do it I push it and they push it back so I mean I tend to think uh, you don't have to be in my classroom if you want to come it's fantastic right we can have a fun semester together and more intellectually stimulating but just engage in issues don't shy away which we tend to do I understand we don't always have the time but you know if we are interested in the terror, you know, you see a news on terrorism and we get hooked onto it. Uh, I think maybe we should also understand this uh, bombing in Aleppo, right? Understand what's going on in Syria, understand what this, put a human face to it. That's yeah. what um, I would say. And um, think, yeah, yeah, critically think about issues. Alrighty, well, thank you so much for coming on. A really, really great discussion we had today. That's all we have tonight for Boise State in the community. I'm your host, Olivia. Have a great evening.